Hey, what's up? Silas here. I'm here with Steven. Say what's up. Hello, everyone. We're here for to continue our conversation series, and this one is specifically about Cracks in the Ivory Tower, the Moral Mess of Higher Education by Jason Brennan and Philip Magnus. Uh, Stephen, could you tell us a bit about why we're talking about this book? Sure. So this book discusses the various ethical concerns within the higher education system. And now, as I've said a few times now, it's not a question of ideology. It's a question of how things are financed, the way the the way the academic the curricula is structured, the classes people have to take that they don't pay for, what incentives academics face, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of ethical concerns that I think should raise some valid questions and also factor into why college is so expensive and doesn't do what it's supposed to. Yeah. And one thing that I think is is key for this, we are focusing on higher education in the United States of America, which is uh, what Jason Brennan and Philip Magnus did. And that's about 9,500 schools, which I checked, it was around that, roughly that. And part of the importance of this, it might be America focused, but the rest of the world looks at America and sees, oh, it's achieved this, we want to be like that. And they're adopting a lot of the systems that are in the higher education system specifically. And you'll see different systems, I think, for undergraduate, but no matter what, not undergraduate, for K through 12 all over the world but when it comes to higher education america is still the gold standard where you have people from other countries sending their kids there like even i think the ccp part of the big connections between china and the united states of america is a lot of high uh, officials in the chinese communist party still come to the united states of america to send their kids to schools in the united states of america so it's still the gold standard and other countries are adopting and trying to match that kind of system. And with this one, we are breaking it down to the different sections of the books. We've recorded uh, five, five parts, six parts, sorry. We recorded six parts, with one of the parts being a discussion on the seven big economic insights, the normative business ethics questions, and descriptive business ethics questions, of which I suggest you listen to before listening to this one. Now I'm going to read you the actual chapters here. Number one, neither gremlins nor poltergeists. Number two, what the academics really want. Number three, why most academic advertising is immoral bullshit. Number four, on entrails and student evaluations. Number five, grades, communication breakdown. Number six, which we'll be getting into today. Number seven, the general education hustle. Number eight, why universities produce too many PhDs. Number nine, cheaters, cheaters everywhere. Number 10, Three big myths about what's plaguing higher education. And number 11, answering the taxpayers. And then after that, we will have one where we kind of review what we've gone over and give some thoughts and lead into or just intro the next series, which is going to be Human Action by Ludwig von Mises. So any thoughts before we get into it for this chapter of number six, when moral language as a is a cover for self-interest? No, I think we can jump right in. I, I listened to some lectures from the, the authors of one of the books they cite in here. You did as well. We can maybe link that, The Elephant in the Brain. I think it, it, it's one of these books that I think I, I sort of looked at the book a little myself. I haven't read the whole thing, but I think it's one of these that got me to understand certain human behaviors that at, on, at first glance may not make sense. But when you look at it through this lens, you'll sort of understand why. Okay. Um, elephant in the brain. So I'll put that as one of the links for uh, connecting with this. And also, I think there's a recent article that I had read with on National Review. I was, I was reading through it, and it was just talking about how public the myth. It was talking about the myth of public uh, sector, public sector, or public school. The myth of public school, and it was talking about how we think of it, and it ties into that lecture that you mentioned about the. Um, elephant in the brain because I listened to that lecture after you suggested that I listened to it and it's about the way we been having some issues with the internet that we've been recording these so here's what I was saying talking about the elephant in the room lecture that Stephen shared with me it's about how we hide and pretend certain things don't exist and there was also another article that was talking about specifically how when we look at public sector versus private sector by just hearing the word public sector 
we think that's benevolent. And then private sector, we think, oh, these are bad, bad people. These are not really about that. Think about how, what you think of when you hear public school versus private school. Somehow private is this cabal of people who just have these interests of their own. But public school is just, yay, let's just have it. It's for the kids. When somebody think of the children, this is all it's about. And then specifically, here yeah, I go on talking about unions, specifically when they strike. And here, when we get back in, I'm talking about private sector unions striking. When they strike, you say, oh, those people just want more money. They're just being like, they're being greedy. They just don't want to like, should actually affect what's happening with the people. They're not caring about the customers. Yet somehow for public sector, we think they're doing it for the kids. So there's this kind of thing. And I think that's also something that will probably expand in this one when moral language is a cover for self-interest. And I think that is a key thing with a lot of people involved in education, especially when you look at the public sector unions, the public teacher, public school unions, with teachers, when they talk about things, they wrap some of these things around morality to avoid some of the basic things where, yes, they mean good. Yes, they're trying to help. Yes, they're trying to do those things, but they're also trying to keep their job. They're also trying to get some more time off. They're also trying to get better conditions, better health care for themselves. And those are things that I think are good to kind of... So that's my <laughs> intro to it. And you can, I think, lead us into the conversation sure. about chapter six, when moral language is a cover for self-interest. Sure. All right. So the chapter opens up with a with a website called Who's Driving You? And it's, it's basically a website dedicated to exposing the issues with Uber and Lyft. And they cite all the accidents and unreliability with certain drivers from that. So at first, it seems like, OK, this is kind of damning. But then let's examine this further. Is this some kind of public advocacy group that's fighting for the public? No, it's an, an initiative of the TLPA, which is the Taxi Cab Limousine and Paratransit Association. So it's put forth by taxi companies which have been lobbying to try and get rid of Uber and Lyft because it's a serious threat to their business. So, mm -hmm. And also this website itself, it doesn't give comparative statistics on how taxis and other transportation services do compared to Uber and Lyft, so that's not telling the full story. And... It also it should be pointed out here that Uber and Lyft together average about seven million rides a day, but they only cite five hundred accidents on their website. So even if you were even if all those accidents were occurring every day, that's still a tiny percentage. So when you add up that that's overall out of millions and millions of rides, what is that? I mean, that's that's virtually almost nothing. Another example here is Jason debated Alfred Epps, who is the former president of the Liberal Party in Canada regarding compulsory voting. Now, for those who don't know, one of Jason's big talking points is that he thinks people have an ethical obligation not to vote. So he was debating a guy who, of course, said, no, everyone should vote. Now, during the debate, Alfred made the usual arguments about, oh, people need to play an active role in their society. If people vote, maybe they'll kill more, care more, et cetera. But apparently Alfred was heard saying earlier in a private conversation that he wanted people to vote because he thought it would mean more people voting for his party. So, again, it's not so much this public interest thing. Another example here, Archer Daniels Midland, that's a farming I, cor corporation, I guess we would say. It's been around since the early 20th century. They... They, they've, they're heavily involved in a lot of production of things like ethanol and corn syrup. So mm -hmm. John, Jonathan Adler here says, ADM has perfected the art of rent-seeking as well as any other company in America. ADM has lobbied for tariff subsidies and regulations. They're responsible for things like corn syrup and soda and ethanol and gasoline. James Bovard wrote in 1995, Thanks to federal protections of the domestic sugar industry, ethanol subsidies and subsidized grain exports and various other programs, ADM has cost the American economy billions of dollars since 1980 and has indirectly cost, mil cost Americans tens of billions of dollars in higher prices and higher taxes over the same period. At least 43% of ADM's annual profits are from heavily subsidized or protected or uh, are from products heavily subsidized or protected by the American government. Moreover, every $1 profits earned by ADM's corn sweetener operation costs consumers $10, and every $1 profits earned from earned by its ethanol operation costs taxpayers $30. So we're, we're paying a lot of money out of pocket to subsidize this stuff, and then uh, at this, that's taking money out of our pockets, and that adds to the prices of things as well. So, of course, ADM doesn't admit this openly. They say things like, we're turning crops into products that meet the world's growing and vital needs for more food, more energy, and healthier environment. They actually have an initiative called ADM Cares, and they have the usual slogans about 
feeding our communities, providing affordable energy, you know, the usual stuff. And in, then the author's gone to say, ticks, the currency is power, but the language is morality. There's also, so I, I think as you can sort of see here, all these things I just mentioned are, are presented as we're doing this for the public interest, when in reality, no, there are selfish motivations. So there's also some evidence that sociopaths are overrepresented among politicians. I've seen a study myself that, well, there, there's actually, I've seen a study that is as addictive as cocaine. That's why people are willing to do all, to kill, lie, steal, all of this, because they, they want that fix, as it were. That that was from, I think, CNN, yeah. CNN, NBC. I can find that article for you. And when special interest groups push for changes, it's on moral grounds. But then we should be asking the questions of, if they get their way, who pays, who pays for it and who does it benefit? I think of when I was at CIA, they would try and get more money out of us. Like one of the things that the president of the CIA always got blasted for was that in the speech at graduation, he would always ask for more money. And it's like, after we paid how much to go there. But of course, you know, he didn't, he didn't phrase it as give me more money, phrase it as things like, Oh, if you want to help fund a student's education in the future or things like that. I, I remember shortly before graduation, there was a woman who said something to us like this, like, you know, now if you, if in the future you decide you want to help assist in getting an education, well, here's what you can do. And one of my friends was just like, no, I'd rather buy the Ferrari or something like that. So, <laughs> so, so again, it, it goes to this recurring theme that you sort of touched on that people think that academics are this like sacred class of people that somehow put self-interest aside and we care about students, we care about education, we care about the future. No, they're self-interested, same as anyone else. And as I'll get into in the next section, it, it's, it may not be that they're actively being evil. Like they don't see themselves as, oh, we're screwing the public. They, they may genuinely think, they may genuinely think where we're doing the right thing or we're helping these people, but that gets into how the brain sort of hides those evil motives. Well, not evil motives, but selfish motives from us. Sure. Any thoughts or comments on that? It's, you have to look into how are some of these things measured because there definitely are things that these things are doing that are successful in general. If something becomes more ne it's overtly negative than it is positive, people normally stop doing it, but even in general, it just can't maintain itself for long enough. It'll, even if people don't notice it's doing more harm, it'll just find a way to whittle itself out of existence. This is just yeah. a common thing that happens with organisms and the systems, the social constructs that the human organism has created. It also, they, they, they work on the same rules that define us as life forms. Yeah. So some things will just eventually just, just go away. So when you're looking at something with uh, the first thing you'd mentioned was with the accidents reporting 500 out of billions, but do they in something like that? Even if you have those figures, and you even if you were to subscribe to the whole one accident is too much, which I I don't really subscribe to. I'm no. being more realistic with these things. Do they figure in how many accidents would have occurred if these people were actually driving on their own? Because it's not like they would stop needing to actually be in a vehicle to get to one location to the other. So you could get to a situation where it's, even if you had those 500 out and you say, okay, we're going to save the 500 by ending the 1 billion a day done by Lyft and done by these people, then that means those people who were in those 1 billion rides would still be on the road. And then that might actually be 5,000 accidents. We don't know this. So that's something to kind of think about when you think about some of the figures in those things. I don't, and again, with this one, they might actually go into studies to actually talk about that. With the the thing with the voting is, is voting caring? That's, 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 I guess this video is probably going to come out after the, yeah, it's definitely going to be posted after the election has been done. But these ongoing memes about every time you post something that even has something close to do with the election, it'll come up with and have a notification. I saw somebody actually post a meme talking about how it's, it's a clip from Super Troopers, the movie. It was a great comedy movie uh, by Broken Lizard. And there was a scene where uh, the, the cops are making fun of them. Like they, they drive by them and they pull over and then they, they, they drive by. Like people get freaked out. They know that they've taken some drugs. And the guy is looking back. He's like, I pulled over. I can't pull over any further. I've already pulled over. So he has the guy saying, <laughs> like, I've already registered to vote. I can't register anymore. Yeah. I can't register any further. And then we did. And with that meme, there was a notification by Facebook saying, <laughs> click here for voting notification. Because 
the thing is so it's so obtrusive it's so everywhere they're just pushing it on you and as you said it is because they think more voters would support them i don't know why they think that certain people do have certain beliefs in that kind of system when you say that i also was wondering if facebook understands higher voter participation is a positive thing for the united states of america for people will they now keep doing this for elections all over the world in other countries let's say there's an election coming up in Hong Kong, they can region, they, they have those things where they can regionally target you. Like the adverts I get, I'm not getting adverts from the United States of America. I'm getting adverts targeted in Kenya. But if I'm clicking an article that has something to do from the United States of America, it's still telling me about registering to vote. Although I do have my location uh, for, I might have my residence actually as still with uh, Manhattan, which is like the last residence. I don't know. No, I think it's Nairobi. But regardless, it's still in there. That's actually still being done. So I'm wondering, why won't they actually continue this practice of pushing out voting all, all over the world, in China, in African countries, in Cuba, in other places where they might not be as, as, uh, as, as conducive to a voting environment, to say the least. I don't know if, they, if that's going to be a new thing that, that they actually have. Uh, what else had you mentioned? You mentioned the rent, rent seeking with the big farmer with the big farming. Yeah, that's a, that's a common thing that happens. And my surprise is, as we mentioned before in the previous talks, there's some schools where it's just simply going to a certain school and having that degree with that school on there gets people to hire you. They don't really care about what you actually studied. Oh, this person has a GPA of this from this institution. That means we're going to give them this job. They don't look in to actually see how well you scored in other courses or what you did in this, what was the actual content of the thing. Just that name alone gives it higher points. Now, on the inverse, with this kind of big pharma type of things, there's certain practices that are done by public schools that if somebody hears this thing, oh, without realizing this is something done by public school, this is something done by a public school union. If you told them it was a private school, they'd be like, oh, that's bad because it's a private school. It's for profit. Oh, that's bad if, if, a, if a company did this. But if you just tell them, no, that was actually done by public sector, all of a sudden it's, oh, uh, you know, it's, it's for the people. It's, it's, it's yeah. okay. So that whole idea of, of using certain language, how it covers up for the self-interest, that's something that I think is important. And the sociopaths thing, I think another field, this is not completely negative. There are certain things where, yes, it is better to be easier to actually see people and make certain practical decisions. There some decisions where I'd almost prefer a computer just do it. Like they might even be a legal system where you just put in the actual evidence that's actually there, have the computer just say, okay, this person has been proven to do this, 99% chance that this is accurate and we're going to do this now. So now we're going to figure out kind of sentence because we found that 95% of people who go undergo this sentence, and there might be a way in some kind of zeitgeist future to have some robot that's able to do that. Because when you bring in these emotions, that actually does skew people and give people preferences. If somebody is a racist, that could come from an emotional place. But if you have something that they're a sociopath and they don't even have Sociopaths don't really have the ability to be racist <laughs> because they just think of themselves and everybody else is just meat. <laughs> so, so would you prefer a very emotional racist as a politician or a sociopath? I might go with a sociopath <laughs> in, in that kind of situation. But another field I think that has high sociopathy is uh, emergency room doctors and surgeons. Mm. And in that sense, it's positive because they can come and just see the human being as this is just a meat machine I need to fix versus somebody being so emotional of, of somebody's kids. Like, and then you, you're going into these flashbacks of your life and trying to empathize with the pain that person is feeling. And that could actually slow your ability to actually achieve what you're trying to do in the healing. And I think with the last thing I'm just going to mention, CIA is a culinary institute of America, which you went to and it's not the CIA. We're not spooks. <laughs> and one question about the CIA with the people asking for money, which is a regular thing that's done in all universities, all colleges, public, mm -hmm. private, wherever you're at, does CIA have an endowment? Because that's something that many colleges have, and I'm not quite sure how endowments tend to be actually spent in general. I, I'm not I, sure. I didn't look. I didn't look into that as much. Somebody when I was there was saying that they got grants. I don't. I don't. I don't know enough about that. I never really looked into it because I mean it is a private institution, not a state school. So, 
Uh, maybe maybe it'll be something to look into. Maybe I'll bring look into it and bring it up in a future video. But of course, as I said in a previous video, they do this whole like, oh, we're not for profit thing when it's like you have restaurants open to the public. They open a brewery. They're obviously selling merchandise. And of course, yeah, they're using a lot of raw goods in terms of food and stuff. But it's like for what people pay to go there, you know, it's not it doesn't they're making more money than is going out for sure. <laughs> where they're, they're making more money. I checked here. Um, uh, I checked here. It says, uh, do public colleges have endowments? Most public colleges and universities have no substantial endowments. 54% of private institutions have endowments of less than 10 million. Let me see if I can see who has the, Harvard has the largest endowment in the world. It says here from English and Wikipedia, I mean, they give us sources below. Where is the hard, largest one? Endowment per capita. Largest one was Harvard. Wow. Okay, in, 20, in 2005, the endowment table below totaled $219 billion. By 2015, it was $394 billion. So in wow. 10 years, it went up almost double. Wow. A total farther increase. Okay, then from by 2015, a total farther increase to $479 billion in 2018. What's going on? What is going on with these endowments? <laughs> What's happening? Uh, so, so that's that's kind of absurd. And uh, if if people know what endowments do, I think that's just something to keep in mind. I, I I'm not quite sure exactly what they do, but uh, yeah. So that's neither here nor there for now. But yeah, that's 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 a lot of money. So what's what's happening with all that? Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so a few points. I was just going to sort of add on to what you said before I go to the next section. So the statistics uh, with accidents and things are kind of funny in a way because it's like a lot of people don't know them. They just get, they buy into sensationalism generated by the media. Like there was that thing Steven Pinker points out about how you're more likely to die falling off of a ladder than you are to get killed by a tornado. But people turn on the TV, they see tornadoes, they freak out and they think that's going to happen. Like we, you know, there was that thing about people worry about shark attacks, but it's like, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than attacked by a shark. And I think it was like, 15 people died of lightning strikes last year. There's the whole thing with police shootings about people worry about that. But what is it like 89 people died from bee, wasp and hornet stings last year. So it's like you're way more likely to get stung to death than you are to get be unarmed and get killed by a cop. So it's like a lot of these statistics, people just don't know. They just the media will blow up a particular story. People freak out and they think it's happening everywhere. When if you actually look into it, no, this is these were a few incidents. They just got held up for sensationalism. So this will sort of continue as the discussion goes on, but like with teachers unions and things like I know someone who's a teacher and he admits he likes his benefits and all that. And look, I mean, he's married with a family. I don't, I don't knock him for that, obviously, but then this gets into the questions of, okay, who pays for it? How effective is he at his job? I, I, I mean, I think knowing him as I do, I'm sure he's a decent teacher at least, but the question becomes if you get someone who's not good, but then they're sort of shielded from being fired and things like that, that raises more questions. And then with Archer Daniels Midland, I mean, it's not just them. I mean, other companies do the same thing. And I sort of got annoyed with Nancy McLean's criticism of public choice and James Buchanan about she ends her book with something like, oh, he's imputing the motives of people who he doesn't know and has never met. It's like, well, first off, again, as I'll get into this in this next section, we're not arguing these are evil people. Like there may be people in Archer Daniels Midland who say, oh, I just want a job. Maybe I think I am making a difference, all that. Like they're not doing this to be malicious. It's just – Reality is they're they're acting in their self-interest. That interest has a cost, and that cost is imposed on other people without their consent. That's all. That's all we're arguing. And it, and again, it'll be, it'll come up more in this in the next section about general education. Too many PhDs. These are not people that are saying, oh, we want to rip off students or we want to overcharge for education. It's no, we want jobs, we want raises, we want to make sure our jobs are guaranteed. It's just it's people acting in their self-interest. It's just they will rationalize it in a way that they can say they're claiming the moral high ground. So uh, again, why, why yeah. this is somehow different it, for politicians or academics. Nobody has been able to convince me why that's the case. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. The people are, people are people. So people yeah. will have a tendency, including me, including Steven, these are things that we do is to try and capitalize on the profits of our actions as much as possible and try to socialize the losses as, as much as possible. So if you give them the tools and the means to do that, you will find that there's going to be people that do that. And in general, people will be nice and have the ability to empathize with other people and realize sometimes that might happen to me as well. But 
few people in there who have less scruples when it comes to that and the tools that are effective for them to actually achieve that, they will actively seek those things out versus the average person who just happens to be doing something they think is positive and then they get in a situation and then they realize, oh, maybe I can get a little more of the profits here in a legal manner without harming anyone directly. And oh, maybe I can socialize the negatives here in a legal manner without harming anyone directly and in keeping in mind that they're caring for themselves and others. That is a the general situation I say most people are in, but some of these tools you have to admit, if somebody wants to shoot you, there's very few people that are out there wanting to shoot people, but or to harm people, to kill people, but if possible, and there was a gun versus a spoon, the people who want to shoot you will go for the gun. <laughs> yeah. The people who want to kill people more effectively will go for the gun. So that's, that's the kind of situation. I just think take the gun off the table as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, that, it's, it, that it's might, also. I might get this whole media flag <laughs> back and forth by right it there. <laughs> well, yeah. it's all it's also that thing about like if it saves just one life, it's like, well, but again, whose life are you saving? Like if there's two people dangling off a cliff, one is a loved one, the other is someone you hate, and you can only save one, well, who are you gonna pick? I mean, you're not, you know, <laughs> ideal. I mean, if you're a yeah. really good person, you may try to save both, or if it's possible, you may save both. But if you have to pick between one and the other, okay, you're obviously gonna favor one over the other. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. Like you know, if like if you had to save like oh, you could save one person in a hospital or something, and you know someone. Well, of course you're going to pick that person over everyone else. I mean, it's not. I mean, how many? But then again, you you put anyone else in that same position, they'd likely do the same. It's not. Again, it's not evil. It's just yeah. people looking out for their own. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is practical. It's practical nature. It's, it's human nature. Human nature, and we are we are natural. Okay. So next next section. Sure. So people aren't necessarily bad, but find ways to rationalize their behavior. The book, The Elephant in the Brain by Kevin Stimler and Robin Hansen show that we have involved, we have evolved it to engage in self-deception about our own motivations. Our brains trick us into thinking we're acting better than we are. So th this is sort of interesting, like, I guess to explain it simply, what I would say is that we evolved, we evolved in tribes. So we evolved to develop systems of rules that we realize we benefit from being in. So for example, laws against murder came about because most people would forego the right, if you want to look at it at that way, to murder someone on the condition that they'd be protected if someone killed or tried to kill them. Well, they wouldn't be protected, but it would be, they know that if someone were to kill them, there would be consequences for it. So that's going to deter people from possibly killing them. It's the same thing. Again, now there may be people that they may want to kill, but they're willing to say, okay, I'm willing to give that up as it were, if, if it means I'm kept safe. So it's the same thing with theft. It's like, I, I can't steal from other people and get away with it. But at the same time, I know there would be consequences if people stole from me. So that's going to prevent people likely from stealing from me. However, we, we the other side of this is that we're also self-interested in that we realize we can benefit ourselves by bending those rules, even breaking them at the margins. So you know, somebody may think, as you sort of touched on, like, oh, you know, I can go get these subsidies. I'll make a little more money. Oh, I you know, oh, I can pocket the server's tips and they won't notice. There's things like that. So again, it's not that the person is actively doing it, but the person is still motivated by self-interest and they think, okay, if I can find ways to get around these rules I'm and it benefits me, I'm going to do it. And then the other side of this though is that we also evolve to notice when other people are breaking the rules because if you think about it, we want to keep the group together. We want to keep the organization cohesive, especially if it's a business or something. So we're going to notice when other people break the rules because – it's that whole thing. If you let one or two people break the rules, everyone will. And then the whole thing just breaks down. So if it, if one or two people steal and you let it slide, other people are going to pick up on that. They're going to start stealing. There's no consequences. And then it's just the business falls apart. So we evolved to notice this and make sure that these rules are kept, kept in place and that enforced. So it keeps everyone in check. Now, Again, we tend to pursue our own interests, but believe we're doing the right thing. So your brain pursues selfish behaviors, but hides your motives from you. And it's funny because he, Robin Hanson talks in that video about people believing in conspiracy theories. And he says, you yourself are a conspiracy. It, because it's like, you, you want to do things that benefit you, but you can find ways to justify it to yourself that you may not even be consciously aware of. The author of this book studied a few different things. For example, they studied charity. They studied buying expensive items and even just conspicuous consumption in general. 
And what they concluded is that these are all forms of signaling. Like, for example, a charity, people will give money to charity, but some of it is how do I look to friends, family, and the public in general? Buying expensive items, it shows your status. You buy an expensive car, people think you're important. You buy a Rolex, people think you have money. I don't know if you saw that thing, but there was that actor from the office where he was at the Oscars and he was wearing his Rolex and his wife was holding it. And there was, it was a joke because like, he's kind of an average looking guy, but his wife is this really pretty woman, but she's holding his Rolex. We're like, wow, this is kind of symbolic, but it's, it's the same thing. It's like, he's on this prestige. Yeah. However he looks, he's on this prestigious show and he's wearing a Rolex, which shows he's higher status. And then again, conspicuous consumption, same thing. It's like, people will just buy a lot to show status like people may buy a ton of art even that doesn't look that good but they may be trying to show i'm cultured or i am sophisticated or i appreciate certain tastes and the signaling thing again in of itself it's not inherently a bad thing i mean we evolved in these tribes we evolved we're social animals we want to have status so ways we can develop that status and show it i mean that proves that we're successful people that we're good mates all that so that in of itself isn't a bad thing but if you look at it from that point of view that's why people do those things and Simbler and Hansen suggest we look for the best ex explanation for a person's behavior. So, for example, one of the studies they did with charity, they found that a lot of people haven't looked into the charities themselves and seen how effectively do they use the money that's given to them. Because there, there was that chart I saw ago showing how certain of the famous charities like the March of Dimes, I think it was one that only a certain percentage of the money that's given actually ends up in the hands of poor people. And then so you can do a breakdown side by side seeing if I give for every dollar, how much ends up in the hands of a poor person it might be 20 cents. It might be 40 cents, whatever, but it's worth examining it. But what they found in their studies was that only 3% of people, when they actually looked into it and found out that a lot of the money wasn't going directly to charity, they, they didn't change their mind. They just kept giving that charity. So his point was, it was more, it's more about signaling to people, Oh, look, I'm a virtuous person because I give money to this big name charity. And the explanations for this again it's it's visibility peer pressure and mating motive it's they people want to be seen recognized for having that status people may be pressured oh i gave this much to charity people want to sort of keep up with it make sure they're doing they they look just as good or better and then of course mating motive again it's like oh look i'm a good person i i can provide a lot Get, you know i i could be a valuable partner that's what they're trying to make and Similar Hansen, the authors of Ivory Tower, and I'm I'm sure we I, I don't want to speak for you, but I definitely would say that we're not arguing that people are 100 percent selfish. And it, realistically, we couldn't be because if we were civilization would break down and also the signaling wouldn't work. It wouldn't be, oh, here's this good person giving money to charity. It would be seen as, oh, here's a sap giving his money away. So if again, if we were completely selfish, this wouldn't work. So there has to be some genuine concern for the others or it wouldn't matter. And. I think of what Jonathan Haidt says about man is 90% chimpanzee, 10% ant, and meaning, yeah, we have those selfish primate instincts, but at the same time, we do cooperate a bit. And even primates are not completely selfish. They do work together to a point as well. But we're a little more cooperative, but we're not like these hive insects where like it's about the good of the hive and an individual insect will sacrifice itself to save the whole hive. Human beings generally are not like that. And – most of us do have the moral mo have moral motives to a point, but we tend to think we're better people than we truly are when it comes down to it. A lot of our actions are for selfish reasons. Okay, <laughs> long long bit, but uh, any comments or thoughts? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I think again something I've mentioned in previous conversations is we we are we are beings, we are biological beings, and I think society is a social construct created in order to serve our biology. And as a living being, our genetics, the main is reproduction. So as you mentioned there with the mating motive, I think when you take that out of a lot of behavior, there's some things that we do that are complicated, some things that we do are convoluted. But when you take out that mating motive, some things just seem completely ridiculous. Right? Like why is somebody even doing this? But once you plug that in, you're like, okay, that, that, that now makes some sense. Now, exactly as I mentioned, as I just mentioned, it could be complicated, could be, but normally removing that motive from it will reduce your ability to understand almost anything that we do in society. It could be many ways removed, but it's still there. Like a similar thing, like you said, with uh, the, some of the rules from the consequences. That's one thing that I was thinking maybe I, maybe I, 
project too much and I expect that there's far fewer people that literally believe that. There's people who say on one end, if we didn't have the state, it'd just be chaos. There's people who say, well, if I didn't have God, they'd just be chaos. You'd, you'd just be in all these things. But I ask either of those people, if you're American, for example, do you think if the Russian government all of a sudden stopped, stopped existing, there'd be chaos in the United States of America? You probably don't think that. But that is that shows that you don't necessarily believe that a government is the only way to have, existence of the state is the only way to have it. It's why do you think your state is somehow definitive in why you and everybody around you is moral? When it comes to religions, you ask a Christian, okay, if you tell me if I don't believe in the Christian God, there's going to be vaping and pillaging, but are you, how come you're not worried that your lack of belief in Allah means you're going to be raping and pillaging? Because you don't put any credence in the actual system that Muslims have of their God or the, of the Jews have of, uh, of is it Yahweh, you know, is it Yahweh? I keep forgetting who is Yahweh. Yahweh is yeah. I think the, and then Yahweh. Yahweh is for is for the the Jews, or you don't you're not you're not worried about Zeus, or you're not worried about Tiamat and these people. You're not worried about Shiva. Yet the people who believe in those gods might think their system is needed. Just how in the past there's forms of governments, there's forms of states, there's forms of organizations that we once thought if they that didn't exist, they're not. Nazis, a lot of the people in Germany at that time thought if we did have the Third Reich, human, humanity would dissolve. Now that's one of the most hateful and destructive things. But if you talk to an actual Nazi from back then or the few neo-Nazis that exist now, they still truly believe that is the future. That is how you're going to organize people. So I think with that one, I might just be being, might be being too exacting and expecting of this and also realize that there might be other in-depth ways where it's not necessarily necessarily simply the existence of laws, but your connections to it. Whereas somebody in the United States of America might think, I'm going to respect and not steal here, because if I get caught here, my family lives here. But if they were, let's say, in Russia, that same security system is there. The same punishment for that same crime is there. But if they know they're catching up in the next couple of hours, they would steal that candy bar because they know there's no chance you're going to come back to that place and get that punishment. So, so I think it's 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 probably a bit a bit more convoluted. Or I think in this case it might be convoluted. Then then I then I'm giving credit for the thing. It's not simply just oh, do you believe in in just religion in just the state? It's their relationship to the the selfishness that they care for because. It's not just them, but it's also if my family gets caught, if all these other things happen, if things are uncomfortable and that were extended way for so there's more steps that I think I might be ignoring and, and not paying attention. I don't know. Well, I yeah. think it's inter it's interesting too, because when Aristotle was writing way when Aristotle was writing way back when, he talked about examining the ethics of different civilizations around him. And he talked about how Babylonians, Persians, Egyptians, Greeks, all, all of them at the time, they all had laws against murder, laws against theft, things like that. So I think obviously he, he was nowhere near this yet, but when they started doing evolutionary psychology, they started explaining that, okay, human beings have a need for this because people want to be kept safe. People want what they own to be kept safe, all that. Because some people would say, oh, well, this was due to religion. But I think what he was sort of foreshadowing, and ultimately people like these authors are arguing, is that, no, we have – we have an instinct to be kept safe. Again, we're willing to forego being willing to do certain violent things on the condition that we're kept safe in return because people realize like, okay, well, if I can steal and get away with it and anyone else can, well, what, who's going to keep me safe? Cause then a, mo a mob can easily show up at my house and just loot everything I have. So there, yeah. there's that as there's that aspect of it. And then I was thinking back to what I mentioned in a previous discussion where I was talking about like, you know, bosses having affairs with employees and things and that whole story at that place I used to work. And I remember when the boss was accused, he he got really defensive and he was like, oh, how could people say this about me? I love my wife, all that. And what I was thinking sort of in line with this book here, that may very well have been the case. And as far as I know, he and his wife are still together. But the point is that he, in his head, it wasn't oh, I'm getting back at my wife or something. It was like, oh, I'll get some action on the side. Oh, maybe I'm, you know, it'll happen after work. Nobody will know. Nobody will say anything. And again, when he says that, he may sincerely mean it, but the point is he's still doing something else in his self-interest, which morally would be at odds with that.
So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I, this is one thing that uh, humans, some humans have a tendency to do to put us separate from the animal kingdom. And as you mentioned, where <laughs> the, that quote, where 90% chimp and then uh, 10% ants, we look at other animals, other animals engage in war, other animals have different kinds of social interactions, certain animals are monogamous, certain animals are polygamous, certain animals are serial, engage in serial, serial monogamy. With our brains, there's almost no behavior pattern that humans have developed that is also not present in some other life form in some other way. Because I think higher than the fact that the social constructs that we've created with civilization are based on our biology to save our biology, we are also sharing this environment of the earth. We are also earthlings above above animals, other things that organize, not even just life forms, because there's some certain structures that are inanimate, that are not alive, rocks and minerals and things like that, where they seem to mimic certain things that we create, that we find effective in different ways. Because there's just certain things that being on the earth, that environment will dictate certain patterns and certain behaviors that are more optimal to this environment, to flourishing in this environment. But uh, the thing like to get to this was, I think if we if we realize that we can see that yes yeah, sure if you take away religion if you take away the state if you take away these structures of punishment and things like that it's not just going to be chaos and destruction and end because you can find other life forms that don't have a state government that don't have religions that don't have commandments and things like this that aren't just constantly raping and pillaging everything they come across yeah. those animals still have certain biological understandings and limits that we as humans have codified in the social context that we have in the civilizations. Yeah. Definitely. And that's similar to education. There is a need to learn information. All these other animals happen to teach the next generations of their life forms to continue existing. We are part of, we are all the 0.00001% of life forms that have existed on earth that went extinct, extinct without any actual human direct invo involvement that have found ways to teach their offspring without institutions of higher learning, without college, without free, <laughs> universal free college education. They've been able to do it. So sure, we have codified and created the structure of higher education. But I mean, if we take that away, we have to take away teaching kids, teaching information. There's still other ways to actually achieve that. Some ways could be better, some ways could be worse, and that's kind of what we're discussing here. Yeah. Well, and to sort of elaborate on Jonathan Haidt's point, what he, he says in his book, The Righteous Mind, he talks about how there were actually more individualistic insects, we know, because we found them preserved in amber, fossils, all that. But the theory at the moment is that the more individualistic insects died out because they, of course, dealt dealing with predators, they couldn't fend for themselves, they couldn't support themselves as well. So at one point, at some point, insects, I don't know if they figured it out, I mean, they don't have much intelligence, but some somehow insects like the ants termites all this they ended up working together and and some way or another it, it was decided for the survival of their species that if they work together that's that's how they would survive and thrive so you that's why you have a queen drones workers all that and the thing is again it's like an individual drone will sacrifice itself if it means saving the queen because that means saving the whole colony now with humans it's more complicated because again we're selfish being primates but at the same time we we have to work together because way back when people figured out, well, OK, I can't just live in the wilderness by myself, hunt and everything. If I work with a group of people, I can I can hunt. We can hunt bigger animals together. We can farm together. We can build housing together. So it makes sense to work together. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we we obviously still have warlike tendencies and we still fought each other. But at the same time, there is we are inclined towards cooperation for that reason. And like we've touched on it a little bit in other discussions with the whole division of labor thing, like nobody wants to be a hundred percent self-sufficient. I mean, do you want to make your own clothes, generate your own power, grow all your own food? It's like at some point you would realize this isn't worthwhile use of your time. It's beneficial to outsource those things to other people. And what's interesting too, is some people, I know Gad Sad talks about this, that some think we, our intelligence actually evolved so we could manipulate each other in order to get some of these things done, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, it's man manipulation, usage of tools. These are all these are all positive things, and I think we we have human re resource departments because humans are actually the most effective tool. And 
I, I thought about this a long time ago. It also reminded me you were, you were talking about the structures with collective animals like ants. And I was thinking, okay, matriarchies tend to be collectivist. And when you look at these collective organisms, collective life forms, they tend to be skewed greatly. Where, where I, I don't know if there's an example where one, one in hundreds of females, it's normally the inverse where these are tied around a, a much fewer females and majority of the species are males that serve the female. So there could be something in feminists that are kind of <laughs> wanting that collectivist type of thing where they build societies where they have hundreds of men serving them in some sort of way. So you might have a situation where maybe, yeah, matriarch, matriarchal societies tend to be more collectivist, tend to have that kind of situation. And are we already living in something similar to that where you have men, men in general are people who predominantly pay tax, or predominantly the tax base of, I think, all countries where taxes exist are males, and females tend to be more tax consumers. So maybe you have a situation where you have flexible kind of situations where look at the black community, black queen, and the black queens of the family, and they're getting out of the world, and lots of support from the different society, from different yeah. structures in society that are created by men, are manned by men, and the resources coming from men, like, it's it's they could be some kind of situation in there where where that's kind of tied where you have these informal kind of things where you can say okay this female is benefiting from the resources of this how many men does it actually take are involved in the process of from mining the resources inventing the resources creating the resources and providing the service coming back to the female and it might be a situation where there's actually a whole lot of constantly fluctuating movements of those kind of structures I don't know. I Want to look into more? Huh. Well, yeah. well, I would ar I would yeah. argue too with this example you're imagining. It's also a case of rent seeking and dispersed cost concentrated benefits. It's oh tax all these other people and give it to women or whatever. But then it's like oh well, just all these other people have all this money. So if we take some from them and give it to me, it's benefit. It's it's oh they can rationalize in their heads that well they have more than they need so it's fine i'll i'll get some benefits which are owed to me for this reason so it's just it's a i think it's another form of rent seeking in that yeah and that's the thing again and that's just who defines how, how much you've had like should you when you talk about universal free college like, should you be allowed to go to, this is one thing i just asked americans people are talking about that why should you be allowed to go to college before every single student in the world has been to at least one English English course? Why should you be guaranteed a degree? Like, should we make sure that, the, the, think about the lowest common denominator of what you consider to be education that is your supposed right and expectation. Should we ensure that every human in the world has access to that worrying about your degree and postgraduate degree? Like, why should should you have that before anybody has those basics? That's a question for the people who say this is a right and something that should be actually done. Why are you limiting it to yourself or your country? And I'm I'm saying you're doing that because I understand humans are self-interested. I, I I just don't think you're calling BS to your your claim that this is some kind of universal morality that you have. Just admit that you're looking out for yourself yeah. and you don't really give two dams about <laughs> the kid in Timbuktu who hasn't never read a book, you want to make sure that because you read 50 books on feminist gender studies or feminist basket weaving, that you should be insured a job. Don't, yeah. don't try and pretend that it's from some kind of equity type of thing out there. It's self-interest and make the case for it. Yeah. 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 All right. So the next section, I like this. It's called Baptist bootleggers and campus social justice activism funny things that at first glance don't seem to go together but they do and i'll explain why so public choice okay. economist bruce yandel pointed out how politics creates strange alliances often between selfish and morally motivated groups for example baptists and bootleggers support dry county or quote-unquote blue laws prohibiting the sale of alcohol on a sunday and of course if you go further back when prohibition was nationwide you saw these sorts of alliances too and it even says here that bootleggers have even donated to help the back Baptist activism. So the larger point in saying this is that while there is a group that may w w want this for some sort of moralistic reason, there also are uh, groups of other people who want this for selfish reasons. So 
people want if alcohol is outlawed on some days or completely well that's going to create a, a black market where people can upcharge for alcohol and make it themselves all that and they can profit and a few other examples of this would be for example uh, costco is pushing for a higher minimum wage and people were saying oh yeah, i like that they pay their employees more but then what i would argue is well why are they put why are they pushing for a nationwide higher minimum wage and one of the explanations they've gotten is because there are companies less labor intensive, so they can easily take on that higher cost, but then it'll bankrupt all these little mom and pop shops who then in turn, that'll sort of fill the vo create a void. And then they can take over that void because for me, it's like, you just want to pay your employees more, just pay them more. It's like, why do you have to go to the government and do it? And it's, well, no, cause they know yeah. they can, they can shoulder the cost, but then it's going to negatively impact their competition. And there was actually an article written uh, comparing uh, Walmart to Costco on this. I can find it and send it to you. And this sort of ties into all these social justice crusades on campus. So some of these may be valid. Like, for example, at Georgetown, they used to have university presidents' uh, names on buildings, and they found that some of these university presidents actually sold slaves to pay off the university's debts. So – some of the outrage here, okay, I, I get why you would criticize that. And well, well, what they did actually was they renamed some of the buildings and they actually offered to pay tuition to the descendants of those slaves, which I thought I thought it's kind of a nice gesture. And oh, wow. Dude, yeah. that's a very practical, useful yeah. kind of thing. It's not just your virtue signaling like this yeah. person was related to this. I think in in that case, yeah, that, that's something yeah. I can get behind. And yeah. Despite my little chuckle there, where you could yeah. say. This this institution directly first person benefited from slave trade. So here is our actual reparations to directly the people who suffered from this instead yeah. of this general nebulous. Just give, give me my goods. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's the same thing with Germany and Israel. I mean, a lot of Israel was founded on German taxpayer money, but then the justification, of course, is like, well, the Holocaust, and it's, okay, now Germany was in a rough place after the war, but at the same time, it's like, well, a lot of the initial people who went to Israel were descendants of people killed, so that makes sense from that point of view. And, yeah. and again, so there may be valid complaints or valid solutions to some of these problems here, but then you have things like what happened at Evergreen, which we talked about in one of the videos in the previous series, Oberlin had a 14 page doc document of demands of social justice about like this many black people should be hired, this percentage of black professors, all this. Of course, Oberlin did the opposite of Evergreen and stood their ground and said, no, we're not doing this. The Ivy League schools, of course, have spent millions on this. They cite the numbers in the book, but I think like Yale has spent like 60 million, someone else spent 50 million, all that. So the Ivy Leagues are trying to outwoke, e schools are trying to outwoke each other <laughs> essentially. And but there, but there is an interesting pattern that should be pointed out here. So students demand money and power and tenured positions for departments where they learn these ideas. So, for example, usually it's in English, literature, comparative literature departments, anything ending in studies, you, you get where this is going. And these departments are also the most tuition-dependent departments with the fewest available sources of outside funding. So, again, we can get into the merits of what they're complaining about. Is it valid? people may think they're genuinely doing the right thing, but also consider who pays for this and who benefits. Like it's a little suspicious that students come out of these departments and then they say, give these departments more money. And then the professors who taught them would benefit from that. That should at least raise some questions. And also too, to sort of touch on what you said, colleges are probably the safest place in the world for women and minorities. Like this whole thing about women, one in three women will get raped on college. It's bogus. It's, it's, they went around, they asked, women questions like did you have sex while drunk did you have sex and regret it all this and then everything was concluded counted as rape and then they just use that to say so it's like if you were to actually break that down no it's it's not going to be that it's just they redefine words then go use that to goose the numbers and then the question is like well why aren't these activists more active in countries like saudi arabia where homosexuals get thrown off of buildings and other things like that and is that, well, it's it's easier, it's safer, and there's more to gain. They can get more tuition money, whereas you go to Saudi Arabia, you protest the stuff, you'll get killed, probably publicly executed. So the analogy here is that students are the Baptists, the faculty are the bootleggers. Now, are the students just pawns for the professors to get more money and everything? Maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say. Again, we don't know what's in people's minds, but this does seem suspicious if 
they come out of these classes, they're pushing for more money and then it benefits these people who are teaching them this stuff. So it's at least worth asking any thoughts yeah. or comments. That's a, that's a good way of looking at it where there, there is a relationship here. It's not just the students. It's not just the teachers. It's not just the administration. It's a trinity of self-interested parties with different kind of things that meet the table and say, Hey, let's eat together. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. We're not pointing the figure at any one group and saying, Oh, you're bad. You're, you're, you're the worst of the sort, but it's about actual being able to actually deal with things and not just painting with a broad brush. Like you mentioned, as we had in the conversation of the 1619 project, I think that is an excellent thing with the Georgetown thing where some of these times you say, okay, yeah, you pointed out an issue, but what is a specific issue and how do we address that specific yeah. issue in an appropriate manner? And that's a simple thing. If you can show this was actually bought with slaves, with yeah. proceeds from selling slaves, this is a very practical and, and way to do it, not just broad brush, use a fire hose and just spray everything around. Uh, the other one was here was what did I write down here? The safety and colleges thing. That is a good point. And that also, a, it was very few actual, it was, I think it was two or three actual studies, such a limit to how they define the actual term. And then many other people kept requoting that one thing. Somebody would source that thing and then they'd say, okay, it's from this source. And then these two or three other blogs or these two or three other articles wrote about this, then that will count as five sources in the article you're reading. But if you actually go and look at all those articles, there's all quoting back to the same study. It might even be different sections in the same study. Sometimes it's the same actual, it's the same actual graph that they talked about from that study without actually going to how the terms were defined. Like somebody will say a scale of I thought like it was, how much was it? Oh, it was complete blackout drunk. I had no choice into, I feel of course, because I was going to get made fun of the next day. That's all put on one thing of oh, sexual assault. And sometimes sexual assault is equated to rape. There, there are these things, all rape yeah. are assault, not all sexual assault is rape. That's kind of something to, to keep in mind. When but but it, again, it's uh, I've harped on this a few times, but it's like the thing with the so-called pay gap. It's like, how did you arrive at that number? You're comparing total earnings of men versus women. Then you have to get into which of those women took time out of work to raise children. What about in individual fields? Oh, okay, like, well, sorry, let me let me back up a bit. So like, what if you talk about like general studies? Like, okay, if more women go into social sciences as opposed to hard sciences, well, there's more demand for the STEM field, so they're going to pay better. And then in individual fields, like I know Christina Hoff Summers pointed out, in medicine, what is it? More men go into cardiology, more women go into pediatrics. Cardiology pays better. So it's like there's there's all these things to look at. It's just it's just it's this one statistic is gotten, and then it just gets repeated endlessly. Or like we talked about in 1619, the thing about. 50% of the Southern economy was from cotton. Well, how did you get that? Through a faulty calculation. But it's one of those things that someone latches on to and then it just gets repeated endlessly and nobody looks at where did this actually come from and how did you arrive at that number? So it's like, if for me, what it is, is if certain things seem a bit off like this, it's like, I, I, I like to look into it and see how they arrived at it. And if, if it's like, if it was faulty calculation or distortion or false equivalency or whatever errors they made, it's, it, it's worth re-examining at very least. Yeah. yeah. It seems like we're we're very and they, people in general are very uneducated about how the system of education works. Yeah, and it was some of the things in here, even in the funding of certain departments, as we mentioned, there were some departments that seem to have better funding and more funding. Just have a situation where you keep the same system. Right now, most of the funding is somehow government related, and they're going to fund what's good for their resources. They're going to fund more widgets to add into the government thing, and that's why you see at some of these departments, the gender studies type of things. There's that one person, that one tweet. I think we mentioned this a few <laughs> conversations ago. So it was like, oh, well, you just spent four years studying gender studies, or studying critical theory. Uh, President Trump just signed an executive order banning it from uh, being taught in government offices. It's if that thing is still worthwhile, shouldn't you be able to have all these companies in the private sector still want your actual information, your actual teaching? Or do you have to have it to be mandated by the state that if you're a state employee, you have to go to these courses? So why is somebody counting on that? You can keep the colleges as they are, keep the universities as they are, but would people think, what would you think if they just took out all the state money, took out all the tax money, took out all the redistributed money, where it's like, okay, we still have these structures, and then the university itself 
has to go to a few private sector people and say, listen to the private sector, a few people who are saying, look, if you fund our gender studies department, we'll make sure that our kids who will be thankful because we'll be telling them, look, GlaxoSmithKline have funded our, our, the same way it's done when GlaxoSmithKline funds a research department at a university to develop a new drug. The people who have gotten their studies from there often have that thankfulness because we're human beings and we care and we see, well, they funded this. I'm going to go work at GlaxoSmithKline after that, or I'm going to actually benefit from some of the research that's done here. GlaxoSmithKline will. So they'll invest in that department. They'll buy better, uh, better what's it called? centrifuges and get the kind of tech and do all these things and send you information if some person is doing a, some study they'll pay for that research paper so you, the students can have that info that happens do a similar thing and have the gender studies department make their own have their own teachers do the actual studies approach GlaxoSmithKline and say hey fund our gender studies mm -hmm. course because we've shown that if a scientist somehow or a biologist also understands gender studies, they somehow will be able to create for you better drugs that are more profitable, and that system will still happen, or whatever equivalent of that. This can still happen. We're not saying end gender studies. We're not saying end all universities and all these as a talk, like we talked about in the last talk, about the, the, most, the most absurd uh, college courses. Just have those things, but you don't have to fund them in this coercive way. Just make the case for these things actually being profitable in some kind of way. Or if they aren't, let people who want to pay for the full cost of both monetarily and in time without the expectation of getting that money back from other people somehow after it on their own. And, and I think it will be a better situation for all parties involved. Yeah. Well, I think I mentioned this in a previous conversation too, but it was like the example the chef said to me about if you work for a hotel chain and they get you into like a management trainee program and they say, you go back to school, we'll pay for it, work for us in return. I mean, I, I definitely like arrangements like that, but it's like, like for example, with my friend, I, you know, I don't mean to keep picking on her, but like with gender studies, it's like, oh, it was very interesting. What are you going to do? Oh, well, I had fun. It's like, okay, but where does, where does it come that where 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 does it say that we have to fund your hobbies? If you find something interesting, fine. But it's like, is it worth lending people tens of thousands of dollars? What are you going to do with this? I have no idea. It's like, well, I mean, <laughs> it's 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 like it's it's like picture like any other hobby. Would we give? Would we lend someone money just to do that? It's like the whole point is that you use it in a productive way to make more money. Now people will say that's cold, that's capitalist, whatever. But again, it's like. You're, if, if you want to spend your own money on your own time, fine. But it's like if you want someone to lend you that, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that should raise ethical concerns for most people. So let's see here. So the next section is moral grandstanding about tenure. So not only do students protesting use moral language to cover their self-interest, but professors do as well, especially when it comes to tenure. So the argument for tenure is that it protects academic freedom and enhances research productivity. Now, these arguments get advanced repeatedly, but like many other things, do these bear out or are these just talking points that we take for granted? So it's not one, it's not clear that tenure helps academic freedom. Many colleges have academic freedom guidelines written into their contracts. And to be fair, this is somewhat debatable because, I mean, it is harder to fire someone with tenure than without. So you can kind of understand that. But let's put some of these arguments to the test. We'd want to compare tenure track to not tenure research orient tenure, already tenured research oriented faculty, we'd have to adjust for variables, for example, compare people in the same fields. Like for example, in math, it's very hard to have a groundbreaking study because so much has been established already where psychology, new stuff comes out all the time. So we have to compare individuals in the same schools of thought. So there are some, there are some studies on this. The most sophisticated paper actually offers a negative result. So Economists Jonathan Brogard, Joseph Engelberg, and Ed Edward Van Wessep summarized with this. So they took a sample of all academics who passed through the top 50 economics and finance departments from 1996 to 2014 and study and studied to see if tenure if tenure led the faculty to pursuing riskier ideas. They analyzed their work and they found the number of quote unquote home run, meaning like the best, the best publications peaked at tenure and fell in the decade thereafter. Similar trends held for those at the top 10 institutions in general. Because because remember, originally they're talking the top 50, but it holds true in the top 50 as well as the top 10. So 
What was interesting here, though, is they actually found the opposite among poorly cited publications, that in the lesser known publications, the numbers actually rose pre and post tenure. So they wonder if that's the effect of people who are lesser known are working hard because they want to become established, whereas people who are already in the top places kind of feel like, okay, I made it, and they relax a little. They found that in the two years after faculty received tenure, publications dropped about 30% and then about 15% uh, through the rest of the decade. And the number of home run applications dropped dramatically as well. So again, it's the theory is sort of that they get tenure, then it's like, oh, good, I made it, and they relax a bit. Like they still put out research, obviously, but they're not they're not pushing as hard because they're not trying to win that tenure. So the researchers considered whether tenure has other benefits, for example, the freedom to do risky or interdisciplinary work. They didn't find evidence of such an effect. They also controlled for whether a drop in productivity may simply result from getting tenure or from a natural decline in the years after receiving a PhD, and they found that tenure has an independent effect. So again, that's another theory. If people get their PhD, they sort of relax a little because they wrote their dissertation versus does it does it tie to tenure? And they found that elite institute they evaluated elite institutions and found that professors peak during the year they received tenure and decline afterwards. So the tenure game, as we sort of talked about in a previous chapter, it's do or die. You get you get tenure, you get fired. You have to put out some really good work, and you either get tenure or they get rid of you. So, again, same thing. People work hard. They they know, oh, good, I've made it, and they relax a bit. So the, the example they use is Tom Brady. Like, would he try as hard if he knew he was guaranteed a position no matter what or if he could be replaced? Yeah, I mean, some people will work hard just out of for their own reasons. But again, there's less incentive to because they know, OK, I could be replaced if I don't live up to my expectations, if I don't live up to the expectations that come with my prestige and the salary I'm getting. So yeah. Tom, Tom, Thomas Goodwin and Raymond Sauer examined 140 economics professors from seven research oriented departments. They didn't measure the effects of tenure, but they did find the number of publications tended to peak about 10 to 15 years after the author received their PhD and then declined after. So this is similar to what the last study found. Now, to be fair, they didn't test to see if the quality improved as the quantity declined. So that's another theory that some professors may put out better publications as opposed to a lot of them, so they may feel less inclined to keep writing. It's That's debatable, but quant the quantity itself sure did decline, and it seems to peak shortly after most faculty receive tenure. So they may get tenure, they, may, they work really hard, they may put out a bunch of things, and then they sort of become complacent. So again, we're talking about economists, but what about other fields? So Stephen Sessi, Wendy Williams, and Katrine Mueller-Johnson – surveyed over a thousand professors. So wait, so no, wait, sorry, I skipped ahead. So Leon Lionel Lewis studied publications from a variety of fields. He found the same pattern. So next next up is what about the thesis that their tenure protects academic freedom? So then the people I decided, Stephen Sessi, Wendy Williams, and Katrine Mueller Johnson surveyed over a thousand professors to see how they'd react over dilemmas involving colleagues teaching unpopular courses, investigating uh, uh publishing controversial findings or investigating controversial topics. They said they found that about 40% said they'd be brave and defend them. But remember, this is 40% said they would do something. So most, a lot of people say they'll act brave, but then when push comes to shove, will they? Will they? So 40% is upper bound. It could even be less than that. So this idea that even tenured professors are going to step up to protect their colleagues with controversial findings doesn't seem to really hold up. And Again, the strongest defense of tenure seems to be more theoretical rather than empirical for these reasons. So part of it, again, is that tenure does help that professors keep their jobs from – it keeps them from being replaced versus something like adjuncts who there's a lot more of them and they're easily replaced. So they do – there is that job security, but does it enhance academic freedom and research output? And it doesn't seem to be the case. So any thoughts or comments? Yeah, just – Thinking, it's interesting. There's a lot of different things I, I heard there about the tenure because that's something that I think is a is a regular topic. It's a common topic when people discuss higher education. But there was there was some good points. How the simple thing with certain fields, it's okay. You may go to some say okay in uh, one location might have a massive oil field, but that location has been mined, has been plumbed for such a long time where. Now to actually get the oil out of there, you have to go really deep, and it's really hard to actually get oil out of there. They could still yeah. technically be more oil, but you've taken all the surface level stuff. So you have certain fields where people are like, oh, look, this field is amazing because 
oh, that guy is a physicist. Look how little ag is actually coming out of physics. So if you imagine it like an oil well, when you start digging for oil, you get this top level stuff. It's easy to get. So maybe that's what gender studies is, critical theory. They're just on the surface level and they might be more below that. But it also might just be a very shallow pool of oil and there's not really much there. At the end of the day, it might get exhausted before the field of physics, the oil field is super deep, but still has a lot more, but it's now a lot harder to actually plunge those depths. So I think that's kind of good to realize it's not just, don't just, don't just lump the things together. It's, it's good to think about that. And I think one of the things that can help when you look at these, when you look at study, to double check the actual providence or the actual the veracity of those studies, keep an eye with what is done due to the studies, the behavior that people do. For example, with the studies, if somebody says that one in three women are going to be raped, not just sexual, not experience sexual assault or report sexual assault or all these things, like actually raped, in, you know, and then you also have a society that is trying to encourage girls to go to university as much as possible. For those two th things to, to mesh, you'd have to say it literally is a rape culture where you're encouraging girls to go to a place where one in three of them will be raped. And I, I, don't, I don't think people can literally believe that's what universities are because they wouldn't be trying to send girls there as often as, as much as they are because they'd be realizing that's, that's a horrible place to send them. We, we wouldn't want to actually send them to that environment. So um, that's, uh, and, and the last thing, just at what you ended up, is like, yeah, tenure, I think it, it's good to think of it as we are social animals. So tenure is more of a, of, practical security, job security, where it's like, okay, now that I have tenure, I can stay and plan the next 10 years of my life because I understand I'll be paying, getting this much in salary, living in this location. But it's not social security in the sense of the social capital that you have, which which is almost more, more important for, for many humans, especially when you live in a, in a developed country where Maslow's hierarchy of needs for your simple biological life. When they say, I want a living wage, I think that's kind of what most people in developing countries mean. It's not, not simply like living or dying where if I don't have this wage, I'm literally going to die. Yeah. But the living wage, I think, now goes into the, your social life, the way you feel about what yeah. you are, the support systems. That's kind of the life that they have in, in mind. Yeah, yeah. And I'll get to this into this in the next little bit about adjuncts, but I think it's a similar thing with status and all that. So, Okay. All right, so... Next up is talk, a section talking about the adjunct rights movement. So, fr so from what we read, at, we talked about it in a previous chapter, but adjuncts kind of get a raw deal because of how little they get paid. Like they, some of them make like 30000 a year. And of course, the criticism is, well, we're teaching, we're doing all this work. We have all the student debt. Why are we making such little money? Why are there these full professors getting paid way more? So... This part actually surprised me a little bit. This is this was sort of like the idea about grade inflation. There were some things in here that I didn't know, which was good because it shows like, okay, I have my own biases, but they're challenging these as well. So adjuncts have actually been compared to indentured servants and sweatshop workers. The adjuncts rights movement appeared in the U.S. Yeah, I know. And demanding better pay, job benefits, jo uh, job security, larger role in the administration, et cetera. And Adjuncts, of course, again, elephant in the brain, they're likely sincere, but their claims don't hold up to scrutiny. So p papers have been claiming that universities have been replacing full-time professors with adjuncts in order to save money. Adjunctification, they call it. I like that word. But it turns out it's not true. So the ratio of adjuncts has increased over the past 40 years. That's true. So in terms – this is the total – ratios of staff just in general. They said, according to the Department of Education in 1970, the ratio of students to all full-time faculty was 23.2 to 1. As of 2013, this is actually the most recent data, it's 23.7 to 1. So the ratio of faculty, yeah, the ratio of students to faculty hasn't changed that much. Now, the number of adjuncts as a percentage has increased a lot, but but here's the thing. Adjuncts are being added to supplement full-time faculty, not to replace them. So for example, in my experience in a kitchen, you're going to hire more line cooks if you get busy. You're not going to hire more sous chefs and another executive chef because it's like, why pay the salary? Why give them responsibility? You're hiring workers to supplement who's already there. Or as a front of the house manager, same thing. Like you may hire a few new servers or something, but you're not going to hire another sommelier or another manager. There's a point where it's not worth paying that higher salary if, it, if there's no increased output. But if you just need people to teach 
more students, you're just going to hire adjuncts because they're cheaper and you don't need them to do research and all the other things. So here, here it talks about our adjuncts underpaid. Well, so adjuncts often one don't have PhDs and comparing them to an endowed chair and full professor is misleading. It's like comparing someone in the minor leagues to an all-star MLB pitcher, a uh, different roles, different pressures, different level of responsibility. They're not going to get paid the same. So one reason again is adjuncts are paid to teach. That's it. They don't, they don't have to do that much else. They said even the preparation expectations for their classes are low since they often teach classes like intro composition or the various 101 classes. So it's often simpler curricula. A lot of it's already devised for them. So there's a lot less preparation, whereas the more advanced in-depth things, they have to really get in depth, especially with PhD students. So by contrast, full-time faculty have to do committee work, departmental meetings, student advising, applications review, and various other university functions. They also have to referee journals, grant proposals, do book manuscripts, present at scholarly meetings, and often deliver public radio, sorry, public lectures or do radio and TV appearances. Tenure track faculty are expected to produce scholarly research, and even sometimes non-tenure track faculty are expected to produce at least some research as well. Adjuncts are hired to teach and that's just it. Whereas full-time faculty have to teach and do all those other things. So adjuncts also work fewer hours when you compare their duties to their full-time counterparts. They said, as far as the authors can tell, adjuncts work about 75% of the full time that the other professors do. So again, same thing. It's like a sous chef will make a bit more money, but more responsibilities that they're going to work more hours. Whereas the cooks will get cut sooner. Whereas like their cases were sous chefs, they'll cut staff and then the sous chefs will just stay and work the station, but the sous chefs get paid the same regardless. So it's a similar sort of story here. And in conclusion, adjuncts do make less money than full-time professors, but you also have to factor in the fewer duties and less responsibilities. So are they underpaid? It's kind of debatable. And it's like, this also gets into the whole way college is funded, the distortion of the price mechanism where it's not like you go and pay them directly and leave. It's all these third party payments and how much goes to them, how much goes to other things. And that adds to matters too. So are they underpaid? It's debatable, but you have to factor in what I just said with the way combined with the way college is financed. So any thoughts or yeah. comments? I can imagine an adjunctification of the education system, specifically in the United States of America, the higher education system, even K through 12. This is, I think, this can happen you, with these pods and those kind of things. You have that kind of system of people being more open to that with that pod idea where it's some students collect in a certain area and they learn from a certain people, person and a certain thing. You can have that kind of situation where now people get secondary jobs, that kind of way. Second, um, maybe not secondary job, but you get some kind of certification that you are able to be an adjunct in this kind of educational system so you can go and teach in pods. So now you have this kind of situation situation where people have working from home so it's not necessarily full on nine to fives monday through wednesday you have people who say okay we need you to put in four weeks four four days a week at our office and then you need for those four days a week it should be 10 hours a day so you get to pick when you have those four hours four days a week when you have right. those 10 hours a day and on the off days you can go be an adjunct at at a local pod a pod that's yeah. by your place or these are ways yeah. that i think these systems themselves are not necessarily negative, and this is one thing we've mentioned in previous ones where I think part of the things that Stephen and I would agree on is we're looking at the system that is also quite mutated. This isn't a market-facing system. This is a no. system that has been mutated by the state interference and the state involvement, and it's been irradiated by that, and it's a monster to serve the state when the state itself doesn't serve the people. It serves its own existence, its own organism. And, so some of these very good and practical ideas that might have began as very good and practical ideas have been negatively affected by that whole environment that it's in. It's just like taking steroids or being on some kind of drug where it's just going to it's going to change the actual nature of that being. So I think with some of these things, don't just throw out the adjunct thing, but they could be some positive in there because just in general, uh, this question to I guess you could feel the question, but just question in general. Before you heard what we've talked about in the last two sections, what Stephen has told us, did you consider the system of of um, of tenure to be moral 
it's ethical. I think it's ethical because it follows the laws and the rules that are set in, in those departments. But as I mentioned, I think those rules are mutated due to the nature of the state's involvement. But do you consider them moral before you heard this information? And has that information changed your estimation of what it means to pursue tenure? What the people who are in tenure, are they, are they moral in wanting to continue that system? Well, the adjunctification thing was interesting for me because I had heard that talking point a lot too, and I kind of believed it. But then I'm thinking about this in my own mind. Like, for example, when the restaurant's slowing, they cut the the staff and just have managers do work. But the thing is, look at how many more people are going to college now than in the past. So, of course, you're going to need to hire more staff to supplement it. But as I just mm. stated, you're not going to hire all these full-time professors making six-figure salaries. It's like, unless they're producing that much in terms of research, but then if they do that, well, they're going to spend less time teaching. So it's like, they have to sort of weigh that benefit of which people do we want doing research, which people do we want doing teaching, how much of each. And it's like, they have to sort of weigh that cost benefit. Again, it's like, you're not going to hire all these sous chefs just to work stations. You're going to hire them to run the kitchen, cook a little bit, expedite. It's like, you have to decide the cost benefit analysis of how much is it worth paying this person? And then how much in turn do they bring in or what certain things do they do that makes it worth paying them that? So it makes sense that if you're just going to hire more people to teach more students, yeah, you're just going to hire people coming in and teach and that's it. So, yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get more in it in the next section, but with general ed studies, these issues of how it's funded and all this and rent seeking as well. And, you you will see this will this runs very differently to a typical market operation and again people will say oh you just care about profit what about people and it's like again as we keep saying well profit i mean we all profit in some ways i mean using this time to talk to silas is more profitable for me than maybe watching a youtube video or something it's like every, everyone profit you everyone does things to profit however you want to look at it it's just a question of how that price mechanism works so just uh, just a few points to wrap up here. People people in general are selfish, but do have some real moral concerns. People are no different in politics. Some people may sincerely mean well, but beneath all the moral language and sloganeering, there's plenty of self interest. Now we can't read minds, of course. We we but we can examine moral and logical arguments and follow the money. If the moral arguments are weak, but there's money and prestige to be had, we can be sure that there's some self interest here. I like the final paragraph the authors say. We're not complete cynics. People sometimes genuinely mean well, but when you hear a person trying to sell you a moral argument just that just so happens to imply he or she should be the recipient of more. Okay, so we're back in. Excuse us. Sorry. Uh, this I might cut this out. I might, I might keep it in, but we're having some issues. We're just talking about profit and just hit us back up in there, Stephen. Sure. So what I was starting to say is in the next section, we'll talk more about it, the gen ed hustle, as it's called, where things are funded in a sort of a strange way as far as students being forced to take classes for the sake of professors being employed and all that. And we'll, we'll sort of compare and contrast it to how markets work as far as a business has to create demand for its product and then staff accordingly. Whereas this, it's like they're kind of creating their own demand, making people take it. And then that's sort of keeping them around. And, you know, of course, the argument I always get about this is, well, oh, well, you shouldn't just see education as for profit. It's more than that, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, as Silas and I always talk about, like, we all profit in some way or another. I mean, me doing this conversation is more profitable use of my time than maybe something else. Uh, it's like you deciding you're going to spend money that you have to get food because you want that food more than that money. That's profitable to you. It's like we all profit in some way. We all want to use our money and time to get something better than what we had previously. So it's like, again, people say profit's a dirty word. It's like, no, you, you got to stop thinking of it that way. And Again, in the case of the gen and hustle, which we'll get into next section, is it's it's the professors themselves. I mean, they're certainly profiting. It's like don't don't pretend like like profit. It's a two way street here. Yeah, yeah. And if you're saying it's not for profits, what are you calling what you want people to go to? Like I'm saying, if you actually thought people were getting assaulted in schools, you wouldn't be wanting to send them there. If you yeah. actually thought that education itself isn't the point of education isn't the profit of the people who go through it, why would you want universal free education? Why would you want universal free anything? People don't want universal health care because they think health care is a negative, is a loss. They consider health care to be a profit. So that whole idea that it's wrong to run health care with profits in mind, the only reason things exist is because we find they have some kind of profit to them. 
as we were talking about earlier in this conversation, I think we, I think it's part of the conversation, not the pre-conversation we had, Stephen, but uh, we were talking about how there's certain things, certain organisms that even if they're not understood to be directly harmful by the parties and things involved into it, if they are doing more harm than good, eventually they'll end out. And a good example is kind of like with a Ebola that we talked about this before, how Ebola itself is so harmful that it's harmful to itself because it kills off its host so long until like whatever strain of Ebola has spread around whichever organism it's parasiting off of, or, or not parasiting because it's a virus, it doesn't really parasite in that sense, but it dies off a lot faster. Whereas if you have a successful virus, like something like the cold as a disease, by it not being so deadly, it encourages its actual existence because if it was just so harmful, it would wipe out the environment that it exists in. So with these kind of things, they get some kind of homeostasis or some kind of balance where they kind of coexist and work together. And that's kind of what we work with, even going back to what we were talking about with the matriarchal or patriarchal or different kinds of ways of running society. If it's too skewed to the female, you will have too many losses on the male side. If it's too skewed to the male, you will have too many losses on the female side. Even when it comes to individualism, collectivism, you know, by towards the individualism <laughs> there's there's different things where we think of okay this is for me as an individual but i can't think of me every time sometimes even the best thing for me is to do something for you so yeah mm. or for we so, sometimes the best thing for me is best thing for we so just yes. a few point <laughs> just a few points to wrap up here People in general are selfish, but do have some real moral concerns. People are no different in politics. Some people may sincerely mean well, but beneath all that moral language and sloganeering, there's plenty of self-interest. So, well, look, we can't read people's minds. Again, that's why I was annoyed at that Nancy McLean thing about, oh, Buchanan impugned the motives of people he doesn't know. Well, again, he's not saying they're evil. He's just saying they're self-interested in that all these incentives matter in government, same as the private sector. I, again, I haven't heard a single argument against this. So we can, however, follow moral and logical arguments and follow the money as well. So if the moral arguments are weak, are weak but there's money and prestige to be had, I think it's safe to say that there's some self-interest there. So the final paragraph of the chapter, which I like, they said, we're not complete cynics. Sometimes people genuinely mean well, but when you hear a person trying to sell you a moral argument that just so happens to imply that he or she should be the recipient of more money, power, prestige, and resources, we say caveat emptor. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Explain what caveat emptor. That's Latin. It, it, yeah, it means buyer beware. Okay. Uh, yeah. Have you ever? Did you ever see yeah. the movie Matilda with uh, Mara Wilson and uh, Danny DeVito? Is that the one with the peach? No, no, no. It was written by the same author. You're thinking of James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl also wrote Matilda. It's the girl who's super smart and has powers, and uh, she has she's raised by her dysfunctional family and. I don't know. Do you remember that? Might recall it. It's 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 kind of done in that uh, Nightmare Before Christmas kind of kishy like uh, what is that actor? That's the creator's names. I'm forgetting the Tim Burton. It's done in kind of that Tim Burton no, type no, it, of style. It's it's, it's, it's live it's live action, but it was. No, it, I, I know I know live action, but it's kind of like the Beetlejuice kind of uh, look that that the, the the newer Alice in Wonderland where it's it's not. It's not in live action as in Adam's Family type of thing where it's over-exaggerated. It's not filmed like you're just in regular life, but it's more darker colors. I, I think what I have in mind. Let me let me double check. But yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Well, but, but, that, but that was funny because I remember hearing that line in the movie where – where Danny DeVito's character, the father, he sells the principal who's this really like tough, angry lady. He sells her – like he sells her a lemon for a used car and he says – and she, they're yelling on the phone. She goes, yes, of course, I know what caveat emptor means or something like that. And I, I, somehow it came up in my feed on YouTube, but the clip where he's explaining how he fixes up lemons to sell them. So, like, he buys a car for 100 bucks, and he's showing, like, he, he's like, this bumper has fallen off. We should weld it on, but we use super, super glue instead. And then but then they go, won't, the son goes, won't it fall off? He goes, definitely. Matilda goes, isn't that dangerous? He goes, not to me. And then he goes, if you put if you if you if you put sawdust in the engine, it'll be quiet for a couple of miles. And then he shows too how it has over a hundred thousand miles, but he actually hooks something up to it and turns the speedometer back, so it looks like there's a lot less. And like, it's, it's, it's just a funny thing. <laughs> okay, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I double checked, and yeah, it's. I think I think my my memory was mixing the the things yeah. together with James and the Giant Peach, or, because yeah. that one had more yeah. of that dark type of thing. Yeah. Matilda was filmed more just like a regular thing. I just checked the actress was apparently in Miss Doubtfire, but she didn't yeah. really do too much after Matilda back in no. 1996. 96. Yeah. She was in Miracle on 34th Street before. Yeah. The most recent thing she's done is Big Hero 6, the TV series, as I guess the voice of one of the characters. Bojack Horseman, she's on that as well. In the TV series, yeah, no, oh, Mara Wilson, yeah, yeah she, she's one of those. I think she just went to college and is like, I just want a normal life. Like she didn't, yeah. become a dysfunctional college, and, the Hollywood star. <laughs> yeah. that, that's 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 the thing. This is something we, we talked about with that. That's the self-selecting, and this is also another thing yeah. with the universities. People come out to schools. There is something about that environment that self-selects certain people, and it is very influential in the rest of the world. There's something I saw with this, this meme I think I posted. I think you saw it. You might have actually posted for us. No, I, no, one of my friends sent it to me, Derek, and then I posted it, and I think you reacted to it. But the thing where it, it says, uh, like, they went to, like, Nickelodeon, Kids Choice, voters, still picked uh, Joe Biden, despite involvement of some bots. And then somebody commented, and was like, yeah, so you're talking, you're saying that uneducated, uneducated sorry, uneducated, uneducated people with undeveloped brains like joe biden makes some sense so when they talk about that kind of thing whenever you look at these groups and they talk about oh the educated people that have been people have been through higher education system in the united states of america behave in this way and then they try to say that's why everybody else should behave this way that's a very self-selected group the same way yeah. how when you look at hollywood and you say oh people in hollywood behaved a certain way that has nothing to do with what the general public of the united states of no. america is you go even deeper and they go to you look at the popular vote, something being popular within a certain group doesn't mean it's popular with majority of the people you might be grouping as part of that. You take California out of the popular vote in 2019, of 2016, where Hillary Clinton beat um, Donald Trump by 4 million only in California, but she won the popular vote, my popular vote by 3 million. So actually, in reality, if you take California out, and I, that would actually even be specifically, I think you take four major metro city areas of Sacramento, which is the capital of California, the San Francisco metro area, which is another 1.2 million people, Los Angeles, which is the second biggest city in the United States of America, if I'm not mistaken, I think after New York City, which is now about 10 million people in the metro area, and then San Diego, which I think would be in between like the size-wise of Los Angeles and and San Francisco, which is another, uh, how many people? I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. Yeah. You take those areas out and compared to the rest of the country, Donald Trump won the popular vote. If that was a thing, he got more of the popular vote by 1 million. Mm -hmm. So yet that popular vote is still being mentioned when that is essentially just a small percentage of California that accounts for all of that. Mm. So those are just things to keep in mind. I think when you when we start talking about things with the schools, mm. experiences in schools, if you had a good experience in school, think about why you had that good experience and does that apply to everybody else? Yeah. If there's a specific thing that you say is negative in school due to experience or it's racist, it's sexist, it's hard being this way, mm. they might that thing might still exist because it's beneficial to majority of the people involved in it. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're talking about certain topics like this. And I think that's why we try to have these conversations to increase the amount of understanding and information that we have on these topics. And hopefully you <clears throat> out there can also get benefit from listening to this and letting us know where we've missed, what we've missed and what we haven't. And as I said previously, my huh. issue is not my issue is not even the disagreement. It's just this arrogance of like, why doesn't everyone like what I like? Like that whole thing mm -hmm. about like, why would you want to quit there? My friend loves eating there. Or, what do you mean you don't love living in this town? It's like people have it's like be I mean, I'm not the most em empathetic person by a long shot, but it's like at least try and <laughs> at least but at least, but like the point is try and step outside of your own perspective and understand this. Like I say, I mean. A person may work in a place that's suited for them. They may have a great relationship with the boss. So, of course, they're going to say that's a great place. Someone else may not have the same experience. It's just sort of step outside of that perspective. Don't just take your experience, hold it up as gospel and say, oh, this must be the case for everyone. It just it, it just it's very short sighted for me. But you see, that's that's the weird thing about yeah. it that we're, we're, I think we we've tried to talk about there and puzzle out yeah. because they seem to talk about how important my lived experience is. 
yeah. when my lived experience should be something that is very subjective and speaks to the individual, yeah. yet they take my lived experience and then use that description from my lived experience, which is by definition individual, yeah. and then want to prescribe collective things, collective yeah. actions. That's that's something that I yeah. just don't understand. I just want people to break down, like, want to shake them. Like, why can't you see what you're doing? Individualism is right there. It's like that meme where... It's like the the friends of me where uh, <laughs> where it's like Phoebe's character. It's Phoebe and Joey. Whoever who are the actors Lisa Kudrow and who plays Joey Tribbiani. I'm forgetting his name right now. Matthew Perry or oh, Matthew Perry was the other guy. Uh, I forget David, who plays David Joey. Schwimmer was Ross. I remember that. But then I'm trying yeah, to think. David yeah. Schwimmer was Ross. Matthew Perry was uh, Chandler. Who plays Joey Tribbiani? And we're finally getting to the end here, but <laughs> he was talking about the Phoebe teaches Joey meme. Should be one on the screen right now. And I was decrying just how with some of these people, we agree on certain things. Yes, there's individuality. Yes, people learn in different ways. But then when it comes to the situation of what's the solution, we just go separate sides. And <laughs> with the garbled mess that was going on the internet connection, we get back in with me just kind of yelling, exclaiming my consternation. No, <laughs> like, no. we need to push for individuals and we need to push for the ability for people to learn in diverse ways and have this close one-on-one -on -one attention and not just have this one size fits all for everything. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just strange because as we keep saying, it's like, oh, my subjective experience, mine was great. Oh, it must be great for everyone. And it's like, well, I could easily make the reverse argument. Oh, I had a terrible time. Oh, it must be terrible for everyone. Neither one sums up the whole thing. But uh, I don't know. It's just, it's very... <laughs> Again, if someone can explain yeah. to me where I'm wrong, where Silas is wrong on this, go ahead. But it's just, it, it's like, I don't know how they can reconcile my experience, my truth, my subjective experience, my lived experience with this has to be good for everyone. It, it's just, yeah, these things can't be. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I checked Matt LeBlanc. Matt LeBlanc was uh. drawing a blank in my mind. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's, that's it for, for this one. Yep, Anything that's else? It. That's all okay, I have. So Thank you out there for listening. I uh, hope you come back for the next ones. I shall be posting these every Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. I do post, and these ones we recorded some ahead of time. So I think I will be keeping that schedule of posting these and working up to the next one where I think when we do the next one, we're talking about different ways of doing it. It might include some, some live streams of the actual reads of some of them or some supplementary material open up and <laughs> Stephen probably has some more uh, time on his hands and we'll, we'll, we'll work around that we're enjoying doing these and enjoying Definitely. your participation so yeah, yeah thanks a lot till yeah. next Thank time you. Stephen stay on so we can talk about uh, the next recording after this sure. but goodbye bye everyone